Latino and everything in between. Uh, we're so happy that you're here with us today. Um, we hope this will be a very informative town hall regarding emergency rental and utility assistance in California, especially here in uh, Senate District 20 and the Inland Empire. This is one of the hardest things for us to do is to get information out to people. So we hope that so many people will sign in today, get the information, and then share it with your family, your friends, your neighbors, because the assistance is out there and we want to make sure people have everything that they need. Um, I have been lucky to be working with my colleagues and the administration since the pandemic started, and even before, truthfully, to pass legislation and work with the federal government to help people and families uh, during this really, really hard time. Before we begin, though, I really want to thank all the various organizations that helped Team Leva to put this together, including COPE, Congregations Organized for Prophetic Engagement, Inland Equity Partnership, San Bernardino County Rent Relief Partnership, TODEC Legal Center, Legal Aid Society of San Bernardino, Center for Community Action and Environmental Justice, CCAEJ, Inland Congregations, Congregations excuse me, United for Service, ICUC, for change, Inland Counties Legal Services, and West End, Westland Real Estate Group. These groups are helping us to make this happen and get all the information out to folks. Many of these organizations are on the front lines in providing assistance to people in our local communities that are having the toughest time, especially during the pandemic. We know that COVID-19 has really hurt our working families and people were already struggling even before the pandemic began. And of course, the housing crisis in California was bad before COVID. So anything that we can do at the state level, it's our job and it's our responsibility. In the Senate, we took action by investing 12 billion to fight homelessness, and $3 billion to develop and preserve affordable housing. We also helped to secure billions to allow income eligible renters and landlords to reimburse up to 100% of past due rent and utilities. And I just wanna say thank you to everyone here who is helping us do this because they're the ones who brought these ideas to me and I could take them to the Senate so we could try and make sure we were doing the most for the most amount of people. I look forward to hearing from all of the presenters today because I always learn something that I didn't know before. So I am an elected official. I could talk for a very long time, but instead of doing that, I want to get started so we can get you the information you need. If you have any questions or anything, drop it in the chat and Team Leva will keep up with that and we can get back to you and make sure you have all the answers you need. So thank you everyone for being here. When we work together, we win together. And I think I'm now turning it over to Maribel. Thank you so much, Senator Connie Leva, for your leadership and excited to partner with all the organizations um, because knowledge and education is power. Um, and we need our communities to be informed and, and, uh, and we know that we're going to some still kind of coming out of these hard times with COVID-19. And before we have an exciting and informative program and I want to um, be able to talk a little bit about the logistics. Um, Si um, hablan en español y no inglés, uh, Christian Flores um, de ICUC va a dar a traducción y um, el número es 1-866-328-4901 y lo vamos a poner en el chat para la traducción. Tenemos traducción en español. Thank you, Christian. Uh, if for folks that need Spanish translation, Christian from ICUC will help us with the translation. The number is 1-866-328-4901. And yeah, like I said, we're excited to, to continue uh, this program and be able to, to uh, get us through these tough times. And um, I wanted to, um, if there's any questions or anything like that, uh, we will be having that through the segment of the event. And like I said, we're gonna talk about the, the rental assistance and what other um, types of uh, programs are out there for our communities. So I'll first uh, introduce uh, Ms. Uh, Kim Stars uh, from the San Bernardino uh, uh, Cities Program. And we're thankful that we have Council Member Kimberly Calvin and I will talk about the San Bernardino uh, City Program. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you so much. Um, Council Member Calvin, if you want to lead off, I will defer to you. 
Thank you so much, Ms. Dyers. We appreciate you. My name is Kimberly Calvin, San Bernardino City Council member, and we are happy to be part uh, of this team here. Uh, I want to first thank every single person on the call because you guys do this work um, and have been prior to COVID. Boots on the ground is what I like to call this miraculous team, making sure that the information is getting out throughout the city, the counties, surrounding counties, uh, and cities, and it's important that folks know that there is assistance out there for them, and we can't stress it enough. And I do believe that um, as we continue in this work, it's going to be important to, because we don't know how long COVID is going to be around. We don't know how long the need is going to be there. But what we do know is that there are people out here, there are there's funding out here. As you see, we have our Senator on the call and all of these wonderful organizations that were already doing the work to make sure that the people in the cities of San Bernardino, particularly, I'll just speak to them at this moment, that there is funding out here to help you with your utilities, with your housing, um, even going forward. So please make sure that you take down all the information that you can here. If not, I'm sure there will be all the uh, um, information in the chat that will let you know who to call. But I'm going to turn it over to Kimberly Stars from Inland SoCal United Way, who we've partnered with to make sure that we are able to reach every single community member that is in need in the city of San Bernardino. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilmember Calvin. Really appreciate being in this partnership with you and all of the agencies serving the city of San Bernardino. Um, I'm gonna go through this presentation, uh, but please feel free to ask questions in the chat. And also my dear friend, Erica Watkins is going to be presenting on the county's program in just a few minutes. So this is specifically for the city's program. So, we, the biggest message that I would like folks to take away today is that we want you to get your application in as soon as possible. Get your application in today. And there's a, multi, there's a multitude of ways that you can do that. So the preferred application method is through the portal. Um, that's all online. You'll be able to upload all of your documentation via the portal and have um, electronic response sent to you right away confirming your application. It's the easiest and fastest way to get your application in. And you can do that at sbcityrent.com. If you have issues with internet, like I was having this morning, and you're not able to get your application in via the portal, don't worry, there's still an opportunity for you to do that. And you can do that by calling either 855-SB-APPLY or by dialing 211 extension 5. Both of those numbers will get you to case coordinators that can assist you in getting your application in. The majority of our case coordinators are at least bilingual and we have translation services in more than 100 languages. So you will be able to get the assistance you need in the language in which you're most comfortable. Additionally, we have a couple of partners where you can walk in um, to have your application and get assistance from a real live person. We do ask that you make appointments and that can be found, um, your appointment scheduling can be found at sbcityrent.com. Okay, so real quick, here are, um, this is the program kind of in a nutshell. We talked about that website already, sbcityrent.com. We're calling SB, 855-SB-APPLY. We're also the administrators for some other programs in the region and the sites are here, um, just so you have that for reference. But if you put in your application on the portal or you call 211, we do a location screening um, ahead of time to make sure that you're going to the right program for which you're qualified. So don't worry, wherever you land, we'll get you to the right place. So a few items about eligibility. Um, this is a renter tenant benefit program. So this is for folks who rent their homes within the city of San Bernardino. So if you're outside the city limits or you own your home, this program is not for you. Um, this is specifically for our residents um, that are in need in the city of San Bernardino. You do have to demonstrate that you've had a COVID impact, a COVID financial impact. You do have to show proof of ID. You do have to have a household income at or below 80% area median income. And all of these parameters are on 
the site. So I don't want you to be furiously writing notes and trying to get all this information. Just head on over to that site or call the numbers that we've provided and we can walk you through that. So the amount is uncapped. It's 100% of your past due rent. There is no maximum for that amount. Um, and it's also for past due utilities. Um, so it's very generous program. We're really proud um, that the city put together such a generous program and it is making this assistance available to residents who need it. Um, the way that you will be able to have your income determined is through a couple of different ways. If you are unable to provide proof of income, don't worry, okay? That doesn't mean that you will not qualify for this program. Um, there are methods that we can use with either bank statements um, or there's a lot of different ways that you can show your income, including attestation. So please, if you feel intimidated or worried about any of these parameters, my advice to you, give us a call. If you think you might qualify, give us a call, head over to the portal and get that application in today. Additionally, I think something that's very important about this program is that immigration status is not a consideration. And um, so you are able to um, qualify for this program as long as you meet the other qualifying metrics. So how to apply, I keep talking about this, but I think this is the most important thing, friends, how to do it, even if you don't have all of your documentation, even if you only have one thing, head on over, get that application in today. If you're nervous about it, you don't really know how to use a computer, you're not tech savvy, it's okay. Give us a call, we will walk you through it. We are here to help or make an appointment with one of our partner agencies and they will walk you through the process as well. Here is the income eligibility. So the way that you read this chart is you look at the number of people in your household. That's all people living in your household, adults and children. So say you have two adults and two children, you look over at number four and right below it, you need to make $63,200 or less in order to qualify for this program. Pretty easy to read. What documentation do you need? Again, don't worry about taking too many notes. This is on the site as well, but you need all of these things in order to have a completed application and we can help you with that. This is for landlords. Remember folks, although this is a tenant benefit program, the payment goes directly to landlords. Um, so it, we do need landlord cooperation for this iteration of the program. Um, so landlords, we encourage you to be in communication with your tenants and tenants with your landlords that you are intending to apply for this program. And landlords can actually start applications on behalf of their tenants. So if you're a landlord with tenants that are behind, head on over to that portal and you can start that application. Here's information about the program. Again, head over to sbcityrent.com, call us at 855-SB-APPLY or at 211. Really appreciate your partnership and happy to take any questions that you might have. So, um, yeah, there's two questions. Um, thank you, Ms. Stars. Um, and council member Calvin, we have two questions uh, from Greg, Greg Prescott. Uh, how is this program funded? Great question. So the it's a US Department of Treasury program um, that comes directly to the municipality. So the city of San Bernardino received its own allocation for this program. So it's funded through US Department of Treasury. Thank you. And then the I think that I'm not sure if it's the same person, but it, uh, we have another question. What do you need to prove you are COVID impacted? That's, I think a lot of people will cover this today, but just in a nutshell, we understand that it's not one size fits all, right? We understand that not everybody has been impacted by the pandemic in the same way. Um, we encourage you to think about the ways that your life was impacted financially by the pandemic, whether it was reduction of hours, whether it was a layoff, a furlough, um, child care issues. Um, there's a multitude of ways that you can prove that. We encourage you to work with your case coordinator to provide that documentation. Thank you. 
there's another question. Um, sorry, we're fully, uh, it's coming through the chat. Um, and then we are uh, looking at your questions, just to folks to know uh, we're monitoring the chat and then we, we're listing the questions. So uh, does the program cover undocumented people? Yes, document, uh, the immigration status of applicants is not a consideration for this program. What is a consideration are renters who have been impacted financially by the pandemic that fall below certain income thresholds. Thank you. And um, I don't see any other questions. I don't know if there's any last minute questions folks wanna put in the chat. If not, we're gonna move on to the San Bernardino County program. Any other questions folks wanna put in the chat? One more. We have one more question. Uh, there's another question. What if the landlord is undocumented and living out of the country? We work with landlords all over the world. Um, so the ownership of the, of the property is, is not a consideration for the program. We just need specific documentation, um, proving ownership um, and proving that the tenants actually do occupy that unit and they are past due on their rent. Thank you. And then one other question. Um, could I still qualify for assistance if I have a current job but the second job was lost in August of 2020, and I'm just now starting to, I guess, be okay. As long as you fall underneath the income threshold, and that could be considered a, a financial impact of COVID. If you lost your job um, due to the pandemic, whether it's your first or second job, um, that could potentially qualify as long as you still fall within the other parameters. Yeah, these are all great questions, thank you. And then let's give another few seconds here if there's, uh, I think there might be another question coming in. Um, thank you, Ms. Stars. Um, what is the time frame? So once we receive a completed application, um, it does take several weeks for us to process through to funding. Um, but there, I believe that, um, Somebody will be talking about updates to the second iteration of the program that does have different time constraints. But right now, what we're operating with is once we get that completed application, it takes about three weeks to get to funding. So we go through multiple review processes before it gets paid out to landlords. But we're doing everything we can to speed it up every single day. Uh, do pandemic benefits count as income? It, for unemployment, that, that actually is a preferred status, is folks who have been on unemployment within the last 90 days or folks who are currently on unemployment. And yes, it does count as income. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Stars. And, uh, and like I said, this is the San Bernardino City Program. Uh, there are other, I know that uh, City of Rialto, Fontana, they have their own programs. So we do have other cities that don't uh, or unincorporated areas, right? If you live in Muscoy or other areas, um, it's through the county program. And I'm very excited to, to welcome uh, Ms. Erica Watkins from the Housing uh, Solutions. Uh, she's the um, manager uh, from San Bernardino County Development and Housing Agency that will talk more about the uh, emergency assistance um, program and the emergency um, really assistance program aka what we call San Bernardino County uh, Rent Relief Program. So let's welcome Ms. Erica Watkins. Have you on mute? There we go. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me today. Really excited to share information about the county's program. You just heard from Ms. Kimberly Stars, and she is our partner here. So I'm going to try to share our screen so you can see the information. Let's see. It's not currently allowing me to share. 
Just a moment, please. I think we need to add you as co-host. I don't know if um, you know. Okay. You have co-host privileges. There we go. So um, in the county of San Bernardino, serving all of San Bernardino County, except for the cities of San Bernardino and Fontana, we have the San Bernardino County Rent Relief Partnership, which we have um, partnered with Inland SoCal 211 to go ahead and implement this program serving all of our county residents. So I just want to give you a little bit of the program overview. A lot of the information that Kim Burley shared with you earlier is exactly the same with San Bernardino County. One unique piece with San Bernardino County is that we are only serving up to 50% um, area median income. So we have a um, separate program that is being managed by the state of California. So individuals or households with 50% to 80% AMI are actually being served by the state of California through their housing is key program. So just a little bit more about the county's program. So as Kimberly stated, there are eligibility requirements and it is limited to residents of, this, of San Bernardino County. So what we need is a current written lease or a rental agreement. It does not have to be a formal lease. If you have a written agreement between you and the homeowner, then that will suffice. We need for, um, to, as I said, we can only serve households that are 50% area median income and below. And we have to have a documented loss of income or financial impact that is due to, the co due to COVID-19. And what we want to know, as Kimberly stated, assistance is available to qualified households without regard to immigration status. That is not a question. No one will ask you that. We just want to make sure that we serve the households that are in need and keep people housed during this pandemic. That is our goal. The program can help you pay up to 12 months of past due rent. And that includes late fees that were incurred from March 13th forward. So in addition, we can pay your past utility bills as well as up to three months of prospective rent. So we can also help you with future rent payments if you qualify. Now this is a tenant-based program. So tenants have to be part of the equation in getting funds out to needed, to needed families. So we do definitely want landlord participation, but if we're unable to get the landlord to participate in the process, we will definitely continue to work with the tenant to get funding out to go ahead and cover their past due rent and utilities. And you'll see here the program, we want you to go to sbcrent.com to apply for the program. The application is right online. And if you're unable to access internet or you're a little, you know, a little difficulty with tech, that's no problem. Just call 211 extension 5 and Kimberly's team will be right there to help assist you through this process. Now I want to go over required documentation because that's always a big question for people. So again, as I said, we can we are serving county residents except for the cities of San Bernardino and Fontana. So as you see, the city of Fontana is being served by the Housing is Key program and the city of San Bernardino, as Kimberly um, stated earlier, is being served by their very own program, which is sbcity.org. So please again know that if you happen to apply to our program, we will redirect you to the correct program. So don't, don't hesitate, come on, go online, try to gain assistance and we'll make sure you get to the right place. Again, required documentation. And a lot of people are quite intimidated by this process, but it doesn't have to be an intimidating process. If you're confused about anything, submit what it is that you have, and the case managers at 211 will work with you to get the necessary documentation on file so that we can move forward with processing your case. So we will ask for a form of identification. And so it could be your driver's license, a passport, permanent resident card, um, there's a lot of different things that you can provide to go ahead and prove whom you are. 
And if you have a question about that, again, please give us a call 211 extension five. We need a copy of your written agreement and we do need proof of your past due rent or past due utility. We will need um, proof of your 2021 income. It could be your tax returns. It could be if you received unemployment during that time period, we'll need um, proof of that. Um, if you were self-employed, we will need an attestation statement of you stating what your income was at the, during that time period. So again, if you feel like you're missing a piece of documentation, don't let that stop you from applying. Apply, submit what it is that you have, and the case managers will work with you to get whatever it is we need to document that particular item and move you forward through the process. Again, as Kimberly said, we do need um, something that verifies your COVID impact, whether it was loss of income, was it a loss of job, child care issues? Did you have a, an increase in costs related to COVID? So there are a lot of different things that happened during the pandemic. And so we all experienced it in different ways. So, you know, we can work with you to document that. Mm -hmm. And so I just kind of put together a couple of the frequently asked questions. And I'm going to give Kimberly staff credit on this because Kimberly staff have worked really hard. And all the staff at Inland SoCal have worked really hard to kind of figure out what, what information people need and kind of help to kind of pinpoint um, the questions that are coming in the most. So one of the big one is always is citizenship required. It is not a required element of this program. We want to say that over and over again. So we want everyone to understand that we are here to help the community and no one is being excluded. We do have limitations based on income, but please do not feel excluded. Come let us work with you and get you where it is that you need to be. Again, the goal is to keep individuals housed. So we do need ID. And so here are just various forms of identification that we can accept. Um, your foreign passport, a government consulate issued ID, um, a permanent resident card or visa, your military ID, or any other form of ID. So again, any questions you have, call us. And is there an in income restriction? Yes, for the County of San Bernardino, we can only serve households up to 50% AMI. And when you go on to the website, it has a wonderful screening tool. So it will allow you to put in your address. And when you put in your address, it kind of tells you, yes, you qualify for this program and it'll move you forward through the application process. If you don't qualify for our program based on your address, it will redirect you to the correct program, City of Fontana, City of San Bernardino, or the state. Also on the screening tool, it allows you to put in your income and it will let you know whether or not the income that you have input qualifies you for this program. If it, if it doesn't and you are over income, but yet you are still below 80% AMI, you will be redirected to the state's website. So it's a great online portal that is really assisting everyone because again, the goal is to get everyone to the right program to keep them housed. How much past rent due can be, can be provided? We can provide up to 12 months of past due rent. And that goes all the way back to March 13th in our program. Can past due utilities be paid? Yes, they can. Initially, when our program started, we kind of we were not providing past due utilities, but we phased that in. So now we can provide your past due utilities. So do not hesitate to ask. And if you initially applied for the program and did not request utility assistance at that time, you can get back into the portal and go ahead and request that ut utility assistance if it's needed. Can future rent be paid? Yes. So again, we can pay up to three months of future rent, and that is based on funding availability because our goal is first to, to have, help people catch up to where it is that they need to be. We have to address your back rent first before we can look at providing any future rent. And again, this is I asked this specifically to the Inland SoCal team. How can I make sure my application is processed timely? Submit a complete application. So what that means is submit the documentation that you have and when the case managers contact you, letting you know that they need additional documentation or clarification, please follow up timely. And this is just a snapshot of where we are in San Bernardino County right now. So as of last week, we have over 8,200 applications that have been submitted. 
we have been able to disperse over $20 million to landlords and utility companies on behalf of tenants. Over 2,000 households have received assistance and more than 3,500 individuals have re retained their housing, which again is our goal. Another $6 million in applications has been approved and is waiting, awaiting disbursement. And then we have an additional 51 million in applications that is currently in the pipeline. So there, just that number right there shows you that there is a need within this community. So we just wanna make sure that we continue working to get this money out to those households that need this assistance. And this is just a slide, just to remind people about the AB 832 rental protections. So they do exist, but there is a way that you have to go through this process so that you can make sure that you're covered under these protections. I'm not going to give a lot of detail on that, but I just wanted you to know that you can go to the tenant protections guidelines on the housing is key website. They lay it all right out there for you. You can get the information that you need to make sure that you are covered by these rental protections. And again, please go online, complete an application. If you're not able to do it online, please call 211 extension five. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Ms. Erica. And we do have several questions that have come in. Okay. And then we'll also try to monitor if there's any questions in the Facebook chat. So thank you so much. Very informative. And let's get these resources to our community. I'm glad that you're able to help so many people. Um, so the first question is coming from Desiree Mora. I currently have an application through Housing is Key. I haven't heard anything in weeks from anyone. Is there any information here that may help me with my family? We live in the city of Ontario. So if, how, if you have an application in with Housing is Key, that means you are being served, serviced by the state. So unfortunately, I can't give you any information that can assist you directly other than to go to the Housing is Key website. There is a phone number on the Housing is Key website where you can contact, call someone and get some information on your application. And then um, I don't know if any uh, if anybody has that number. Um, I can see chat. if I can find that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then the next question uh, from Greg Prescott. So if I lost my job due to COVID and now I work and get paid under the table, can I qualify right? Well, we're always going to ask to document your, in, your income. So if you are self-employed, um, we will ask you to attest to your income to sign a written attestation statement to what your actual income is. And then uh, from, as a gem or gem Montes, what if the home is leased to one person, but they have roommates? So we, we have to look at the agreement between the landlord and the person on the lease or the written agreement. So that's who, that's what we have to look at. That's who we could disperse um, rent on behalf of. So if you have roommates that aren't on the lease, um, we still have to work directly with that landlord to get to determine what are the arrears and, and we'll work to see if we can make that full payment. Total, every situation is different. So again, if you have a question, don't hesitate to apply submit your application and allow the case managers at Inland SoCal 211 to assist you to get you to where you need to be. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, can there still be assistance if we have to move due to harassment from our landlords? If the question is, can we pay rental arrears if a tenant has moved out of the residence, that they were not evicted due to failure to pay rent, but they moved out of the residence. Can we pay those rental arrears? Is that, if that's the question, we can work with the tenant to pay those rental arrears because part of the program also wants you to be able to have, continue to have housing. And we know that if you leave any um, location, any housing, and you have past due arrears owed to them, that can impact, impact your credit report and that can impact your future housing. So we will work with you. And again, like I said, I, I don't wanna give black and white answers because again, every situation is different. 
So do not hesitate. If you think you qualify based on income, you have that COVID impact, please submit your application and let us work with you to get the right information to, from you and try to process and assist you. Thank you. The next question is from Dana. What if I don't need help with rent because I am not behind, but need help with only utilities and food? You, you can, we do not provide any assistance through this program for food, but we can definitely provide utility assistance. You do not have to have rental arrears to apply for utility assistance. And then the next question is, um, can you use a school or college ID? as ID, I guess, for the. Possibly, I don't wanna say yes or no, um, but typically to um, get registered in school and, and whatnot, you typically have to have provided other documentation as well. So again, apply. And if there's any hesitation on your part because of your lack of your ability to provide your identification, apply we'll help you check the boxes and get your application moving forward. Okay. All right, thank you. The next question from Greg, what if I own my own home? Does this cover my mortgage? What if my adult son was paying rent to me and lost a job? The Summary of County hotline says no relatives and, uh, and refuse my application. Well, actually, first up, I wanna answer your first question. So unfortunately this, program does not assist with mortgage. Okay. We only can assist with rent. Um, if an adult um, child was living with you and was paying rent to you, we do pay rent to relatives that rent, you know, like in your situation from their parent. We do, but we do ask to see a past history of rental payments to that relative to kind of confirm that there actually is an agreement to pay rent. So again, go ahead and apply because we do assist relatives that pay another relative for rent. So please apply. Okay. All right, uh, well, uh, I, I'm not sure if, 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 uh, if there's any questions from Facebook. Um, we're also looking and monitoring the Facebook chat if there's anybody with questions. Uh, but these are very, uh, thanks for answering all these questions, Ms. Erica. And I think it's very, very welcome for our community. So well, I hope it, thank you. Sorry. All right. Uh, I don't know if we have any more questions. I, I don't see anything more posted. Um, all right. And I think that there's still um, money available in the rental assistance program. So if you are in need of the program, please apply. Uh, you know, uh, it's important, right, to be uh, to be informed and to be able to. Uh, apply for these programs. So there's still, um, if you haven't applied yet and you need of a rental assistance, right? That's why we're here to provide that information. Yes, please right. do not disqualify yourselves before you've submitted an application. Please do not because there's money available and we want to help everyone that we can. So please do not disqualify, disqualify yourselves. Thank you again. Okay, great. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Erica. And, uh, and we'll continue. Oh, we have one more. We have one more question. Um, will all this information and links be accessible in one location? So yeah, we are going to be putting together one pager with the different uh, links and literature of information so that folks could, um, could, could do that. And then I think there was a question if Ontario has its own uh, program. I believe not, right? Because uh, the county is only helping uh, all We counties. are serving. We're serving the city of Ontario. Okay. So Ontario does not have their own program. Okay, okay great. So uh, moving us right along, we know that sometimes with rental assistance, you know, I mean, people had some questions and sometimes there's been some issues of getting the rental assistance for different reasons. So we know that there is a need more for uh, tenant advocacy and tenant education. And so we have, um, two great organizations that do a lot of tenant rights and know your rights protections for our tenants and other community members. Uh, I wanted to introduce um, attorneys from the Inland County Legal Services and the Legal Aid of San Bernardino. And we do have um, Mr. We can start off with Legal Aid San Bernardino, uh, Mr. Carl Warren, 
uh, who will provide us some more information about Know Your Rights for our communities. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Legal Aid Society of San Bernardino, along with myself, I'm attorney Carl Wallen. I'm a housing attorney at the Legal Aid Society of San Bernardino. Uh, we thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to be here. And this, morning, or this afternoon, rather, I'll be giving you a presentation on current housing rights and uh, what to expect as a lot of the protections are going to expire at the end of this month. And that's, that's right coming up upon us. So give me just a moment. I'll share my PowerPoint presentation. OK, so I wanted to start the PowerPoint presentation. A lot of people are saying that there's a lot of protections expiring, which is true. But it's important to remember some of the prior protections that will still be in place, even though some protections are being lifted. So uh, while the current protections until the end of the month grant causal protections from evictions for virtually all tenants, uh, cause protections are still going to be in place after the end of this month, just not for everyone. Uh, it will be still for a majority of tenants. So uh, unless you're in a mobile home um, or unless you're in sort of a, a mom and pop a rental of a, of a single family home. Uh, and as long as you've been living in the property for a year or more, you're still going to have cause protections from evictions in all of these scenarios. Uh, so just to give you a brief overcap, you will have to have just cause in the form of either at fault or no fault just cause to evict tenants, uh, even after the protections expire in most cases. There are exceptions. I listed some of them. Um, but the overwhelming majority of tenants will still enjoy these protections as long as they lived on the property for a year or more. So just to recap, just, just cause eviction can be lack of payment, uh, breach of the lease, uh, committing nuisance or waste, not allowing your landlord lawful entry into the property. Those are some at fault just cause reasons you can be evicted. Uh, some no fault just cause reasons you can be evicted. Uh, owner's intent to occupy the property uh, as their own principal residence or moving in a family relative, or if the owner just decides, you know what, I don't want to rent anymore, I'm going to remove the property from the rental market. Uh, or if the owner is intending on selling the property to a new owner who intends on occupying as a principal residence. These are all reasons that you can receive some form of notice for the at fault just cause notices expect something like a three day notice to perform or quit or a three day quit and for the no fault expect something like a 30 or a 60 day notice to quit. So enough with the old stuff, most everyone's here for the new. So the rest of my presentation will uh, cover only what is new, what's exciting, what's going to be happening uh, on and after October 1st of 2021. So the process for eviction between October 1st of 2021 through March 31st of 2022, uh, you can find the court's version of uh, their interpretation of the laws there. I've provided the link. They do, as you can imagine, a wonderful job of listing all of the new changes, but I'm going to do my own job here in this presentation. Um, so if a landlord is going to be evicting a tenant on or after October 1st of 2021 for lack of payment, then the landlord is going to need to do additional things in order to evict, things that they haven't had to do ever before. Uh, these are found in CCP 1179.11. The landlord is going to have to, along with the complaint, submit a statement under penalty of perjury that the landlord has completed an application for rental assistance, but the application was denied. That's right, everyone. Landlords, it is in your best interest to apply for the rental assistance because even if you're intending on evicting the tenant for lack of payment, it's still in your best interest to apply because you're going to have to to evict them for lack of payment. The next thing you're going to have to do along with the complaint is file a final decision from a government rental assistance program showing that you've been denied the rental assistance. Um, those are going to be requirements to even get a summons. So for, for those of you landlords that know, that's the start of the process. It's sort of step one. You're not going to be able to go past step one unless you've done these things. Um, alternatively, you can provide a statement under penalty of perjury that the, the rental uh, agreement began October 1st of 2021. So this is only going to apply for brand new tenancies. This is not going to apply for a renewal of a tenancy or any other scenario. This is only where the tenant for the first time began living the property on or after October 1st. If that is true, 
then the landlord doesn't need to do any of this extra stuff. Uh, the landlord can utilize the old processes with which to evict. They don't have to submit these statements under penalty of perjury or the uh, uh, approved or declined application of rental assistance, none of that. Um, so if you are a tenant and you do move um, in the near future, expect to have a few less protections from lack of payment evictions. All right, more temporary processes that exist between October 1st of 2021 through March 31st of 2022. Again, in actions based in part or whole on non-payment of rent during the COVID period, which mind you is being, it, it, in some ways redefined, but still extended. So lack of payment, even if it's on October 1st of 2021, is still covered pursuant to these laws. And, and this is going to be true all the way until March 31st of 2022. So lack of payment, um, some protect, you're just getting new protections for lack of payment that begins on October 1st. The older protections protect those tenants who couldn't pay before October 1st. Uh, so in this situation, landlords are going to need to provide a new three-day notice to pay rent or quit. So gone away are the 15-day notices to pay rent or quit. You're not going to be receiving any of those anymore. You're not going to be handing those out in most cases. Um, now you're going to be handing out the three-day notice to pay rent or quit with new requirements. And conveniently, those requirements are included on this slide. You're going to need to include the amounts demanded and the dates they became due. You're going to need to include the telephone number and website address for rental assistance, which are also listed on this slide for you. Here's the phone number and here is the website. In addition to this, the three-day notices to quit are going to need this big bulk paragraph of information. If they do not have this, the notices will be defective and likely will not work uh, in the eviction context. Uh, a new procedure is being created for tenants. Um, the, the legal name for it is essentially relief from forfeiture, but, but what does that mean? It, it's creating a new sort of vehicle. So if you're a tenant that's gone through the eviction process and you've lost, um, you have lost and you're awaiting on the sheriff to perform the lockout. Uh, the, the legislature has created a, a way for tenants to try and get relief from forfeiture in this situation, and you would follow this procedure here. So if you find yourself, you know, you haven't been locked out yet, but a judgment has been entered against you, there is still one way to try and get uh, either get more time or actually just completely dismiss the eviction. And to do so, you must do as follows. The tenant submits a verification to the court that a government rental assistance program has approved an application for rental assistance corresponding to part or all of the rental debt demanded in the complaint. So if your rental assistance gets approved in that window of time between getting the judgment and the sheriff's actually performing, you can submit this verification to the court along with a motion um, that's going to be on its own brand new form here in the next couple of days. Uh, you'll actually get a hearing within the next five or 10 days. And at the time of that hearing, if you can show that you've been approved for the rental assistance program and that the rental assistance program has paid, and if necessary, you have also paid the full amount demanded in the complaint, then the case gets dismissed. If you cannot show that you've paid the full amount at that time, you then get one more follow-up hearing within the next 15 days where you will have a stay of execution, which sounds bad, but it's actually a good thing. It delays the amount of time the sheriff takes to perform the eviction. And if during that time you're able to pay the full amount demanded in the complaint, boom, you get your case dismissed. The last process is going to be of particular interest to landlords. Um, some of you landlords may have received 25% or more of the rent demanded from you, but you're, you're looking and you go, you know what, there's 75% of the rent unpaid. What do I do? This slide is the answer to that question. The small claims court between the time period of November 1st of 2021 through October 1st of 2025 will no longer have a limit of $10,000 recovery. So if there's delinquent rents that you're owed, you know, more than 10,000, 20, 30, 40, wh whatever that amount may be, small claims has you covered. So if you're a landlord that's only been paid the 25% and you can't evict your tenants and you've only received 25% of the rent and you go, I want the other 75, this is what you do. You file a small claims action beginning November 1st of 2021, demanding the uh, the rent that has been unpaid. 
Um, and this procedure lasts for quite a while. It's gonna last you between November 1st of 2021 all the way through October 1st of 2025. Uh, Lastly, I, I've cut this presentation pretty short, just in the interest of time, so our other amazing speakers have an opportunity to speak. Um, this is our legal aid slide. Uh, I'm again with the Legal Aid Society of San Bernardino. Feel free to give us a call for a variety of matters, not just housing, housing, conservatorship, guardianship, family law, and some other civil matters. And if you just give me a moment of time, I'm going to pull up a slide that includes Inland County's legal services as well. And then, uh, Greg, if you have anything to share. Greg, uh, are you, I know you, there were some audio issues. Is there anything that you wanted to add, Greg? Right. Okay, great. So um, what we're gonna do now is take any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat, and then we're gonna kind of compile them and then ask them in the order that they've been asked. Um, and I don't know, uh, I know we have Christian. I wanna give a shout out to Christian from ICUC that's uh, doing the translation. So if there's any questions, um, I don't know if there's, uh, if they encourage folks to, from your uh, line uh, to put on the chat as well. So we do have a, a couple of questions, um, Ms. Maria. So in San Bernardino County, there should be a law that they cannot evict you unless they have served you the evict notice and provide that information to the judge to determine the case, even if you are alone in the court proceedings without a lawyer. So I think this is more of a comment. I don't know if, if there's something that um, either yourself, Carl or Greg. Uh, in sort of comment to that, it, that the procedure as described is the proper legal procedure. Um, you know, you're going to be entitled to a service of notice when the notice expires, the, the landlord's going to have to file. Typically, you're served with that and you have the opportunity to respond. And then uh, you have your trial date. Uh, and if you lose, ultimately, the eviction eventually happens. That is the process. Great. Thank you. All right. The next question uh, from Teresa. Small claims would be against a tenant that could not pay, correct? Yes, they would be. Then Maya Herrera, can we be evicted if we applied for the programs, but we weren't able to pay the 25%? Uh, so applying for the program, um, once the payment has been dispersed, uh, you are, the landlord is going to have a lot more limited options as far as evicting you. So just continue to go through that rental assistance process, um, continue to retain your documentation and proof. And then if you are ultimately served with any eviction, please quickly respond and include uh, the proof that you've applied for and possibly rental assistance has paid uh, in your answer. Uh, and that may end up giving you some defenses to the eviction. Okay. All right. Um... Again, if you have any questions, if you're on Facebook, if you want to put on the chat, I encourage you to do so. We'll be monitoring the chat as well. Uh, and then, um, or on Facebook comments, sorry. And if you have any further questions, feel free to add in. We got a few more minutes uh, to take more questions. Feel free to put them in the Facebook, um, I'm sorry, the Zoom chat. All right, so there's one question that's coming in. Uh, can landlords increase rent? Yes. Um, however, there are some protections against that in AB 1482. Uh, those were pre-existing laws uh, that had nothing to do with COVID-19. They, they came about before COVID even existed. Those laws are still in place and still protect uh, tenants in a variety of situations. Um, it does not apply in every single tenancy, but for the most part, this is a very generalized answer, so, so please get legal advice in your specific situation. But as a very generalized answer, landlords typically can't raise the rent more than 10% in a single year. All right, we are, let's see. All right, so there's another question from Teresa. So the landlord may not ever be able to collect the shortage of rent for years. Uh, is there are, any additional help for a landlord to collect? 
they do have this extra process. Uh, the small claims court procedure is much faster and much cheaper um, and typically doesn't even allow attorneys to navigate it, which ultimately makes it a very simple and uh, speedy process to get. You can get a judgment, but there's not any assistance in the landlords enforcing that judgment, no. All right. I think we're waiting to see there's another question. I think we have room for one or two more questions. Two more questions. We've got two, room for two more questions. So the the, the first, uh, the next question is uh, from Lucina. So, um, sorry, I'm trying to make sure because we're trying to take the questions and make sure that they're addressed right correctly. Um, because the manager of the apartments just told me that the moratorium ends this month, are we at risk at eviction? Are we covered? That's kind of how the question came in. Uh, you should take any uh, notices to quit that you receive very, very seriously. Um, you should take any unlawful detainer summons and complaint that you were served with even more seriously. I strongly recommend that you call an agency like England County's Legal Services or the Legal Aid Society of San Bernardino in the event that you receive a notice to quit or a, an unlawful detainer. Um, there are not universal protections against eviction. It is possible to be evicted. Please talk to an attorney. Thank you. The next question is, what are the deadlines regarding responding to eviction notices that tenants need to know about? Uh, well, when you receive the notice, uh, the, the length of the notice is how long you have um, before the landlord can start the eviction process with the filing of a uh, unlawful detainer. There's nothing that you really do during that time as the tenant other than contemplate uh, leaving compliance with the notice or whether or not you're going to fight the unlawful detainer process. Uh, now, the thing that does give you a time limit is the unlawful detainer complaint itself. You have only five court days with which to respond. Please, anything related to eviction, just immediately call an attorney. Do not delay. Okay, great, thank you. So... We need to see if we have another question. We have a, about another minute or so. So yes, this one. So there is a question we already, I'm just waiting for the next question. Uh, we're trying to get that in our list. Um, Uh, what is the number for your services? I think that's what a lot of folks were going to be asking. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You should see it on the screen share here. Uh, then the need help ask us. I'm with the Legal Aid Society of San Bernardino. Our phone number here, 909-889-7328. Um, and we also have Inland County's Legal Services, 888-245-4257. They're also a wonderful service and uh, they do similar work. Okay, great. All right, well, thank you so much. Um, and then if there's any additional questions that folks may have, um, you can definitely email us and we'll add into the questions and, and be able to answer them. Um, I think that uh, not only do we see that tenants have questions, but, but we also have landlords, right? Because through the, for the rental assistance to work, landlords have to be part of the conversation, right? Have to be, um, able to, uh, or interested, I don't know what the word is, but um, landlords have to be part of the conversation in regards to enrolling for these rental assistance programs. And you as a tenant should be talking to landlord if you need you know, uh, some time to pay rent, right? As we were talking about, we have, uh, we did a lot of us advocates and electeds and everyone made sure that there was an extension on the eviction of moratorium. And all of those things could only happen, you as a tenant, if you're in communication with your landlord. So we do have uh, a landlord perspective that will share us some best practices, how to navigate, uh, how a landlord, or if you as a tenant, how to work with a landlord, how to navigate through the rental assistance and how some best practices, how tenants 
uh, how landlords can uh, work with tenants. And I wanted to invite Miss Alicia Wa uh, Wallace from Westland Real Estate Group. Can you hear me okay, Maribel? Yes, we could hear you. Okay, I do apologize. I ended up having to be commuted me I didn't want to miss out on uh, being able to be available at least for questions. Um, kind of in short, just reiterating off of um, anyone who wasn't available at the last town hall. Um, I do work with a real estate group within um, the County of San Bernardino and Los Angeles County residential and commercial properties. Um, best practices more or less that we wanted to be able to keep communicate is, is communication. It's the biggest thing. Um, again, nine times out of 10, you're you know short of you having other issues going on. Your landlord wants to work with you to be able to ensure that you're able to maintain your housing and we're able to get you assistance, whether it be through um, rental assistance and, or utility assistance. So ensuring that you communicate when you're placing your applications um, through the portals, uh, the state, or through the um, city and county programs, just ensure that you are making sure to follow up with your landlord. Um, you know, do you need to follow up with them every hour? No, but you know, every two to three days or so, just do a check in and ensure that there's nothing additional that they may need from you, um, or that they've even just gotten to your application um, is the biggest thing because we need to be working together throughout the process. Um, We've kind of already gone over throughout some of the previous speakers, just the different portals that you're able to access for assistance, but you also can always reach out to your landlord. I, email is usually your, your best bet, um, just to ensure that there's accountability and clear understanding of all information communicated and also so you can recollect any information communicated and um, be able to reach out to them if there's any additional assistances that they may be able to refer you to just the same, um, but this forum, pretty informational as far as even the assistance programs that I'm aware of um, and being able to get you where you need to be. So biggest thing, biggest takeaway, biggest thing that I'm gonna stress is just make sure that you stay in communication. Great, thank you so much. And I'm not sure if we have any questions and thank you. It's always important that we, we do have uh, the perspective of the landlord to know, you know, if they, and also if they had any questions to, uh, to uh, Ms. Kim um, and Ms. Um, Ms. Erica about those programs, but I think it's it's key um, to communicate for the very beginning. Uh, if you're a tenant, if you need those, um, uh, if you need rental assistance, you can't apply as a tenant. You gotta have buy-in. I don't have buy-in, but you gotta have the landlord be able to to apply. Um, all right, one of the we do have a question that came in. Uh, do you have resources for property managers acting as agents on behalf of owners? So essentially, um, some of the resources that Ms. Kimberly already went over this morning um, is, is a very strong one. And then I believe we'll have a, a follow-up document. And there's also some links that I included in there. <clears throat> um, and all of these rental assistance programs, when you're going onto their portals, they do have a landlord link. So as long as you have your owner authorization um, and, and owner documentation, you are able to apply as a landlord. But again, reiterating to sound like a, a broken record, communication. If you place an application, make sure that you're keeping copious records on your end and you're communicating with your residents so that they can do the follow-up on their end. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, if a tenant, uh, another question came in from Daryl. If a tenant commits a gross inaccuracy purposely on their application that is later caught by the rental assistance, uh, I guess, program, could the landlord be required to refund the rental assistance received? That is a question I'm unable to answer. I haven't come across that yet. And we don't, we as a landlord are not processing your application. We are essentially, if you will, a co-applicant to your risk rental assistance application. So we're submitting information just the same. So um, I, I would say we may have to redirect that to some of the program facilitators for the rental assistance because I don't know what ends up happening in the event that there's you know some type of gross misconduct or, or misinformation provided intentionally. So is there anyone there that would like that could answer the question? I'm not sure if from the different attorneys from ICLS or from League of San Bernardino, uh, uh, Legal um, San Bernardino.
Maribel, I think I can answer ahead of it. Um, and if anybody else wants to jump on, obviously, please do. Um, but I can tell you one of the reasons why it takes several weeks for applications to go to funding is because the extensive scan, um, review that we do of all applications, looking for inconsistencies and trying to uncover um, these types of issues. If there's you know, information that's inaccurately um, or fraudulently um, put forward, um, that is what we are seeking to, to work out because there is um, there is um, an opportunity for the for the state or the U.S. Treasury to come back and try to recover that money that's paid out um, by either our agency or any others that are running these programs. So we were very careful about doing that ahead of time. Um, our hope is that we're able to catch those before they reach a funding stage. But I couldn't speak to what happens after funding. All right, thank you. Um, all right, so I don't know if we have any other questions. Um, I don't see any other ones that we have listed. Is there any other questions that folks, um, maybe something that came out of this question, right? With some further questions. If now we're gonna uh, move on to the next uh, speaker. All right, great. Um, let's move us right along. Um, I wanted to, um, um, one of the things, um, I, I'm again, Maribel Nunez with uh, Inland Equity Partnership. So one of the things that we also do, uh, you know, in sharing resources, we are a community engagement advocacy organization. And so I'll share a little bit about some of the efforts, you know, at the state level and at the local level and how we uh, make sure that, you know, we uh, communicate with our electeds and, with, and engage our community to make sure that we have the right legislation at the state level and also um, policies in place at the local level to help some of these issues that ha that were you know were coming out of COVID and some of the financial strains. And so I wanted to thank you know Senator Leva for hosting this event um, and really being a good partner with us. And I know there's going to be COPE and other organizations that shared some of the great work that they're doing that we're doing state and local. But being part of you know um, HHS network and also Housing Now, we've been working to make sure that that there is state funds to pay for um, the uh, rental assistance program, right? So I think for us, if the community needs that, we're gonna fight for that. And then also like, you know, we wanna make sure that uh, organizations like ICLS and um, the legal of San Bernardino County has also funds to protect and uh, inform uh, and defend uh, the, uh, our community members. So we're, we're happy that the Senator has support AB 1487, the State Eviction Prevention Fund, and it's in the, uh, right now in the governor's desk and we'll provide more resources for tenants and other folks to, um, uh, to not get evicted, right? So more than ever, we could see that as the evictions uh, moratorium is closing, we see that uh, like a tsunami, right, of evictions could happen. So we wanna make sure that they have legal protection and that this, the, the legal firms have uh, funding support. We're, and we're gonna continue fund, you know, fighting for funding for affordable housing, uh, hoping that maybe we could extend the eviction moratorium, if not just continue more pro tenant protections and also credit protections as I believe Ms. Kim or someone had mentioned about the, the, the impacts of credit, right? When people are behind rent. So we see that that's gonna impact a lot of other things. The other thing I wanted to mention too, is that um, at the local level, like we are so appreciative, San Bernardino City and others that did the eviction moratorium at, before the state did. And so just continue uh, as advocates at the local level to have more local protections um, and so, and also funding if there is more uh, resources to support for utilities and other things. And then one of the things that, you know, that we're also looking at is, um, and we, we're advocates of affordable housing, we're working on the housing element. So we wanna make sure every city or jurisdiction has to update the number of housing units that they rezone. Uh, and so we feel that with the rezoning process that it's gonna be inclusive for people of color, our working class residents, so that they could be able to live throughout the city and that they're not uh, segregated, right? And we don't have segregated cities because that's definitely still happening. Uh, even with rezoning, that could definitely happen as well. So we're working on that in Rialto, San Bernardino, Fontana, um, all sorts of cities, uh, Victorville, uh, to make sure we have the, the right housing element for our community. And we really continue pushing uh, inclusionary zoning, that there's a housing trust, uh, permanent affordability, rent control, 
So, um, so I'll put, uh, we're also partnering with the housing element. A lot of that, it does include environmental justice. So we are partnering on issues of, of, of the right to community development and, and community development. We are partnering with CCJ. So I just wanted to just share a little bit interest form if you're interested in getting involved. And then I wanted to pass it to uh, Ms. Felicia Jones, the Associate Director of COPE. And then if there's any questions, maybe we could try to answer them both together. But I'll put on the chat uh, our interest form. And I wanted to welcome Ms. Felicia Jones, uh, some of the other great local work and call to action that, that we need to do in our communities. Ms. Felicia. Thank you so much, uh, Mayor Bell. And thank you uh, to uh, Senator Leva for uh, being such a great partner and will always willing to uh, work with community to bring really critical resources to our community. Uh, you know, I'm with, I'm the Associate Director with Congregations Organized for Prophetic Engagement, and uh, we organized uh, faith and community members to really revitalize the communities in which they live, work, and worship. And so much of that means, how are we addressing um, the real crisis that happen in our communities every day? Uh, Mirabelle has referenced so many great things that's happening, uh, both at the state level and the local level. And so many of, of the opportunities that are now before us really are a result of a community stepping up, actually using their power, using their vo voice to move uh, legislators like our Senator and others to really make sure that we are protecting the interests of our communities. So, uh, so that meant winning moratoriums. That also, that also means doing the good work to make sure that we're expanding opportunities and access to housing. We are, uh, we were in a crisis before the pandemic. Uh, housing uh, is a crisis in California and access to affordable housing is a critical uh, uh, issue that, that requires our uh, ongoing attention. And we know that right now the urgency of, of recovery from COVID is so, so important, but we also wanna make sure that our community is invested for the long haul in uh, expanding access to housing opportunities. And so we want to invite you to continue to be part of the, the thought leadership, part of the voices that, that help um, move our decision makers and also so incredibly uh, grateful for uh, council member uh, Kimberly Calvin, who is always a huge champion for, uh, for our community. And they are both Senator Leva and uh, council member Calvin are working within their power to do everything that they can for their communities, but they also need us. And so we're asking you as community to do your part as well and uh, lend your voice, lend your vote uh, when it's time to vote. Uh, so we, we, uh, that is our call to action. We do have an interest form as well, but we are going to uh, submit that. Uh, you will have access to that when we do a follow-up email to all of the participants. And we again, uh, just thank you for taking time out of your Saturday to be here, but we are also asking you to stay the course with us. Uh, stay with us so that, so that we have you and your power and your community really at the doors of our decision makers, making the right decisions in the interest of our housing, our wellness, and all of the other things that we need to make our communities uh, thrive. So we thank you again uh, for this time and opportunity and look forward to engaging with you in the near future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Felicia. And so there, we'll uh, take in uh, some Q and A. Um, and then I think uh, if you could share the link if folks want to get interested in, with COPE. Um, and I also want to give a shout out to Christian from ICUC who's been doing the translation and also helped us organize because I know he's also part of the coalition working with us with Housing Now and, and other local great work. Um, do we do have a question here um, from Maya Herrera. Is there funding to help tenants who need to move? So I think that could be a question for all of us, I guess. Um, I was just sharing about AB 1487. Uh, well, I mean, that's still in, in the governor's desk, but I know um, there's some tenant protections. And uh, when we talk about funding for moving, I'm not really sure. I don't know if anybody knows of any of those programs um, from our, from our um, anyone from uh, Inland SoCal or Miss Erica or ICLS or League or Legal. Uh, that can answer that question. Uh, 
Hi friends, it's something that's being considered by a couple of programs under ERA 2. Um, so it's decisions have not been made yet, but it is a consideration. So more information to come. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Kim. That's correct. So era, ERA 2, ERA 2 does allow for assistance to help individuals move um, to housing that is more um, manageable with their current income. So they've had a significant decrease in income. So where they currently reside, it's no longer um, something that they can maintain. There is um, provision in ERA 2 funding that would allow for that but that is a local jurisdiction decision as to how the programming, the funding would be programmed. And as Kim said, that piece is still in discussion. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, not sure we have an additional, any other questions for our, our, our advocates? Okay. All right, so I think that's it. I think we wanna, um, uh, close the, the event and uh, thank once again our partners and then Senator Connie Leva for helping us host this event and also um, really help us to close this out. So Senator Leva, do you want to close this out? Thank you so much, Maribel. And thank you so much to our presenters. I learned so much. You know, being in Sacramento, my job is to find the money, right? And you guys are the ones that make sure it gets to the right people. So I can't thank you enough for everything that you're doing. I think Councilwoman um, Calvin said it best when she said, you're our boots on the ground, which you absolutely are. And we love partnering with you on Team Leva. Uh, Jeff Green, I wanna thank you for doing such an excellent job in the chat of answering questions. I wanna thank Michael Townsend from my staff who's gonna to put together the one pager so we can find all of this information quickly. But to our presenters and to all of our folks that are doing this every day, bless you. We need you. People appreciate you and Team Leva definitely appreciates you. Maribel, you're always the one that texts me, emails me and says, Senator Leva, we need your vote on this. And I appreciate that a lot. So thank you for everything all of you do. We're all in this together. Thank you. Stay safe, be well, get vaccinated. Thank you, everyone. If we didn't get to all your questions, we will send out the one pager. Thank you, everybody.